Right, there are four types of experiment. These are naturalistic, lab, quasi and field. They are not in any particular order. The four types come out of asking ourselves two questions. The, tw the questions concern the amount of control we place on extraneous variables and the amount of manipulation we engage in for the independent variable. So here's our first question. Are we going to manipulate the IV or are we going to let it vary naturally? And the reasons for this might be ethical or practical. Now to get some meat on those bones, this is the way to think of it. If we're going to manipulate the IV, it could be something like um, a, drug or a drug trial. So in a drug trial, we give some of the participants the drug and some of the participants the placebo and hope to be able to observe differences in the outcomes. Here's an alternative. We've got articulatory suppression activities. So half our participants are given the count backwards in threes from a very large number task, having seen the stimulus material. The other half of the participants are merely told to wait for the duration and then recall. Um, clearly the articulatory suppression is supposed to influence the amount of recall. Then there's whether or not participants were exposed to misleading post-event information in um, eyewitness testimony experiments. So, if we expose the participant to uh, a quite, the, the Loftus and Palmer is the one that I'm thinking of, where they showed them the video footage of the cars and they asked, did the car slow down when it was passing by the white barn? And there was no barn in the background. The amount in which people will invest in that kind of stuff is something that we can manipulate. There are other circumstances where we mustn't manipulate the IV or we can't. So first one that I was thinking of here would have been Balby type hypotheses, deprivation delinquency. Clearly you can't go round manipulating half of your participants so that they have maternal deprivation and the other half don't and then track their lives for the rest of their lives and see which ones wind up in delinquency. It would be unethical but also totally impractical. Another impractical one, birth order effects on social and emotional development. It would make no sense at all to recruit participants at an early age having identified their birth order and then follow their lives to social and emotional development. It would make much more sense to recruit participants with differences in social and emotional development and then work out which of them had been where in birth order. Obviously the birth order remains the independent variable but we're investigating it retrospectively and so can't manipulate it. Um, another one we might think of here, flashbulb type experiments, eyewitness testimony stuff. If we think about a big event like say 911, some of those people were affected directly or their families were. Is their memory for that event different, better, worse, more or less reliable than people who were not directly affected? Um, obviously you can't go around manipulating the, the test condition there, it would be unethical and impractical again. The other distinguishing issue for experimental type is the amount of control we exercise over extraneous variables. Extraneous variables are those things that might influence the dependent variable but that we're not interested in exploring so we try and hold them as constant as possible normally. So with relatively low levels of control being exercised that might be for the reasons of uh, greater ecological validity. We've got examples like Bartlett's War of the Ghosts here. Bartlett um, gave his stimulus material to his participants in live, real social settings, dinner parties, drinks occasions, things like that. Uh, he wanted to contrast that with, say, Ebbinghaus's nonsense syllable type recall experiments and claimed that what he was doing had greater validity because it was more of a real-world situation. Um, similarly, Loftus and Palmer experimented on eyewitness testimony by providing stimulus material before asking questions in, in a real-life setting. Think about those kinds of experiments where the participants see actors apparently engaged in a brawl before, the, before, being, asked the before being asked the questions about what happened. Bystander effect experiments in social psychology show the same kind of thing as well. If we think about how long it takes for people to leave a, a burning building, there have been experiments done to show that the group size influences this. So we'd stick a bunch of people into a room, tell them they were applying for a job, say, and uh, roll some smoke under the door, set the fire alarm off. Time how long it takes for them to escape. What we find is that usually the bigger the group, the longer it takes for people to leave the room. 
not just because it takes more people longer to move, but also because we feel embarrassed in front of larger audiences about taking the initiative or seeming to panic or respond to exceptional circumstances. The problem with it, of course, is that um, it depends what kind of job you were applying for. If you thought that the job you were applying for needed you to show initiative, you'd probably respond quicker. But if you also thought the job you were applying for were, it would make you look better in the application process if you seemed not to be phased by fire alarms, you know, to, to be a bit cool-headed, then maybe it would be better if you didn't rush out of the room. And those extraneous variables aren't controlled, and so for introduce uh, a problem about reliability into the, the procedure. And then the alternative approach, of course, is the batten down the hatches thing, where we take control over all of the extraneous variables we can think of and minimize their impact on the, independent on, on the dependent variable. Harlow did this with his famous research into attachment and monkeys testing the cupboard love hypothesis. Uh, the monkeys were all taken from their moms at roughly the same time, so they'd, they'd had the same amount of contact with their maternal figure. Um, they were comparable in terms of being born at the same point in the year, um, being subject to very, very controlled environmental stimuli, you know, the, the same fur monkey, the same wire monkey, same location for the feeding tube, same distance between the two, same ambient temperature, levels of light, blah, 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 blah. All of those things were regulated and controlled as much as you could. Um, another one of these kind of batten down the hatches kind of experiments or series of experiments is the Milgram obedience series so that all the relevant experience uh, relevant extraneous variables like the proximity the distance between the the subject and the stooge or the prestige of the setting whether it's like a, a genuine office building or part of the university um, the script that the authority figure used whether the authority figure was immediately present or giving instructions over the phone or over a, a loudspeaker. All of those things were controlled to such an extent that Milgram's series of experiments took each of those extraneous variables, manipulated them, and he got a, a very sophisticated set of results that specify very clearly how each of these things influence the obedience behaviours. So here's the four different types of experiments set out according to the two questions I said we needed to ask. Here's the first question down the side here. Are we manipulating the independent variable or are we allowing it to vary naturally? Across the top here, there's a question about how much control we exercise over the extraneous variables. This is the, the, the highly controlled extraneous variables answer and this is the not very highly controlled extraneous variables answer. So when we're in the lab, we are manipulating the independent variable and controlling all the extraneous variables and this this tends to be um, easy to replicate for others it gives us a high level of reliability and the most confidence in our conclusions being accurate when we say that the independent variable and the de dependent variable are related to one another uh, alternatively in the field we still manipulate the independent variable but we exercise less control over extraneous variables so this method is less reliable, but considered to have greater ecological validity. It's more like the real world, so there's more small variations that can take place in and around it that we can't account for. And so um, it, it can still be very useful. It can still provide us with very convincing evidence of the relationship between the independent variable and the dependent variable. But it's more difficult to replicate and so open to criticisms of having less reliability. Um, when we are waiting for natural variations to occur in the independent variable with a highly controlled set of extraneous variables, we're performing a naturalistic experiment. Now these, um, these need more replication. They, they require more peer review input. Um, and that's because there's a lot less confidence in variations that result bringing a tri uh, being attributed to the change in the IV. So since the experiment has to work with changes in the IV that occur naturally, there can be difficulties with how representative the data collected is. It might just be that um, as you were waiting for the natural variations in the IV to occur, you necessarily accumulated a whole load of biases at the same time. Finally, here's um, the last batch of experiments. So these are the ones where we're still waiting for natural variations in the independent variable, but we're also not exercising a lot of control over extraneous variables. In some ways, this is the least scientific of the, uh, the designs, but um, 
probably also the most real world true. So it's the hardest one to replicate reliably. So many changing things going on underneath it. Uh, on the plus side, however, because the experimenter isn't really messing about with anything, the findings are often thought to support the conclusions uh, with the greatest real world or environmental ecological validity. And those are your four basic types there, your four basic sorts of experiment, lab, field, naturalistic and quasi. And they determined which one you're in. It's got nothing to do with wearing lab coats or being outside or some kind of hocus pocus nonsense about nature. It's it's literally to do with the answer to these, these two questions. Are you exercising a lot of control over extraneous variables? And are you manipulating the independent variable or allowing it to vary naturally? And that's the size of it.